In this video, we'll conclude our initial study of the basics of electricity by looking at the motion of a particle in an electric field. We'll also talk about electric dipoles and do some review problems. So we know that if we take a charge and we place it in an electric field, it will experience a force. Remember, by the way, that since Q is the charge that we're placing in the electric field, if the charge is positive, the force on that charge will be in the same direction as the field. And if the charge is negative, then the force will be in the opposite direction of the electric field. Now, if the electric field that we place the charge in is constant, then that means the force will be constant. And of course, we know from first semester physics that if the force on an object is constant, the net force, then the acceleration will be constant. And then we can use our kinematics equations. So I do still expect you to know how to do kinematics problems, because we'll see that a charge moving in an electric field is very, very similar to a mass moving in a gravitational field. So let's take a look at the following example. Uh, what you might want to do is pause the video here and try this yourself. See if you can get all the way through it and get the right answer before looking at my solution. So an electron is accelerated from rest in a uniform electric field of negative 3 times 10 to the 4th newtons per coulomb. How fast will the electron be moving when it's traveled a distance of 0 0.030 meters? And how long does it take to travel that distance? So first of all, you'll notice that I've put up the one-dimensional kinematic equations here. This is a one-dimensional problem. Let me draw out the situation. So we've got an electric field, and I see it's negative here. So I'm going to draw the electric field as going to the left. And again, I'm going to use parallel lines to represent a uniform electric field. In other words, the value of the field is the same everywhere there. Now, by the way, how do we create a constant electric field? This is something that we'll be talking much more about. But basically, if I take two parallel plates, so by the way, these aren't lines, these are plates. So in other words, picture two parallel, you know, pieces of paper held a distance apart. If we take those two parallel plates and we charge them, so that one is positive and the other is negative, then that will create a uniform electric field in that region of space. We know too that if this plate is the positive plate and this plate is the negative plate, then the electric field would go from positive towards negative. Now, in this particular problem, we're going to put an electron in this field. Remember that an electron is a negative particle and therefore since F equals QE, we can see that the force on our electron will be to the right because a negative particle will always experience a force in a direction opposite to the electric field. And of course, one more equation that we're going to need here is Newton's second law, that the net force is equal to the mass times the acceleration. Okay, so the first thing that I'm going to do here is figure out the acceleration of the electron. The acceleration is equal to the net force divided by the mass. And the only force acting is the electrical force. So I'll replace F net with QE over M. And we've got a negative charge, negative 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th. And our electric field is to the left, so I'm going to put a negative here, 3 times 10 to the fourth. And so here I'm just using the basic idea of in one dimensional motion, to the left is negative, to the right is positive. And then I'm going to divide by the mass of my electron, which is 9.11 times 10 to the negative 31st kilograms. If you calculate that, what you should find is that the acceleration is 5.3 times 10 to the 15th meters per second squared. So that's the acceleration of our electron. It's going to be accelerating to the right um, with a value of 5.3 times 10 to the 15th meters per second squared. Once I have the acceleration, now I can do 
the kinematics. So what I want to do is just kind of do what we always do for kinematics. Um, I'm going to say that the initial position of my electron is zero because remember we can always do that. Um, we're told that it travels a distance of 0 0.030 meters so my final position is 0 0.030 meters. My initial velocity is zero and one of the things um, that we don't know is the final velocity and we also don't know how much time it takes to travel that distance. Okay, And so those are the things we want to know. How fast will the electron be moving when it's traveled that distance and how long does it take to do that? So I'm going to start by solving for how fast it's going. Uh, since I don't have t yet, I want the equation that doesn't have t in it, so I'm going to start with that. v squared is equal to v naught squared plus 2a x minus x naught. And we want to do just what we did first semester, cross out anything that's equal to zero, and then solve algebraically. Now here I'm already solved for this algebraically. V is equal to the square root of 2ax. And I should have a plus or minus here, although clearly the object is going to the right at the end, so it's a positive velocity. When you plugged in the numbers, what you should have gotten was 1.8 times 10 to the seventh meters per second. Once I have the final velocity, I can now use this equation to find the time. In other words, V is equal to V naught plus AT. And V naught was zero. So T is just going to be the final velocity divided by the acceleration. When I calculated that, I got 3.3 .3 times 10 to the negative ninth seconds, or 3.3 .3 nanoseconds. So that would be our final answer for how long it takes the electron to move. So again, you'll notice that an electron or any charge moving in an electric field is very similar to the types of problems that we did with one-dimensional kinematics back in the first semester. Let's look at the idea of an electric dipole. An electric dipole is an object that overall is neutral. But within the object, we have a charge separation. So one end of the object is positive, and the other end of the object is negative. But again, overall, the total charge on the object is zero. The object is neutral. It turns out electric dipoles are really important uh, in lots of areas of physics and certainly it's very important in chemistry. For example, we know that a water molecule, which you all know is H2O, if we look at a water molecule, it turns out that the oxygen side and the hydrogen side of the water molecule do not share the electrons equally. So in other words, these two circles here represent the two hydrogen atoms, and this represents the oxygen atom that makes up the, the water molecule. It turns out that the oxygen side kind of hogs the electrons. So one side of the water molecule will be more negative and the other side more positive. In other words, a water molecule is an example of an electric dipole. So let's think about what happens to an electric dipole if we place it in a uniform electric field. So if we've got an electric field pointing to the right that is constant or uniform throughout the area, you'll notice that if we put a dipole in that field, the dipole will simply rotate. In other words, since F is equal to QE, whatever force the positive side of the dipole experiences, the negative side will experience an equal and opposite force. So this force and this force are equal in magnitude, but they're opposite in direction. So the net force is going to be zero. However, you'll notice that what the electric field does is it exerts a torque so that the dipole wants to align with the field. 
So that's really important that an electric dipole will align with a uniform electric field. So the positive side will will turn so that it's in the direction of the field and the negative side will turn so that it's opposite the direction of the field. So if we looked at this at some amount of time later, what we would find is that dipole would want to align with the field in just that way. It turns out there's some interesting, uh, interesting examples that we can look at and see this in action. So here's an example. Will a stream of water from a faucet be deflected by a negatively charged rod and will it be deflected by a positively charged rod? And will it be going towards or away? So in other words, this is something that um, I would do for you in class. If we take a positively charged rod, so I take you know a piece of plastic or, a, well actually plastic would be negative, but um, a glass rod and I charge it so that this end of the glass rod is positive and I hold it near the water, do you think the water will bend towards the rod or away from the rod? And the same thing, same question, for if instead I bring up a negatively charged object. Think about that for a minute, about what you think will happen in each case, and then we'll look at the answer. Okay, well let's take a look at the answer. It turns out that the stream of water will bend towards either a positively or negatively charged rod. And uh, let's make sure that we understand what's actually happening here. So let's say that I've got my stream of water coming down and I hold a positively charged rod near that stream of water. So what's going to happen to the little water molecules as they're streaming down? Well what they're going to do is they're going to rotate so that they align with the electric field being created by that charged positive rod. We know that the electric field would go off something like this from that positive rod. Notice, by the way, this is not a uniform electric field that it's creating. Um, that electric field is going to decrease with distance. So our little water molecule is going to align so that the negative side of the water molecule is to the left and the positive side is to the right. So that's the first thing that's going to happen is each little water molecule as it gets near the positively charged rod is going to align with the field in that way. But now, why do we get attraction? Well, this is really interesting. It's a really important thing to notice about the way electrical forces work. Remember that Coulomb's law is an inverse square law. And that means that distances have a bigger effect than you might imagine. So in other words, if we look at this little water molecule, the electric field is decreasing as we move away from that positively charged rod. It turns out then that the negative side of the water molecule is closer just by the width of a water molecule to the positive rod than the positive side is. And that means since the negative side is closer, we will get attraction. So it's true that the positive side of the water molecule is being repelled, but because it's farther away, the repulsion is less than the attraction for the negative side, and we get an overall attractive effect. Um, it's actually very dramatic. It's very easy to bend water in this way. And, uh, and so to realize that really the only difference is the diameter of that water molecule is really pretty amazing. Well, that's why we'll also get attraction if we do the same thing with a negatively charged rod. Because as the little water molecule comes down, it now simply is going to align the opposite direction. In other words, the positive side of the water molecule will line up with the negative rod and the negative side will be opposite. So once again, notice that the opposite charges are closer than the like charges. And therefore, once again, we get attraction. And it's only the diameter of the water molecule that is different. 
um, and yet that's enough that we get an overall net attraction. By the way, this is a really important point in chemistry. Oftentimes, you know, when you think about atoms or molecules and you think about how they're neutral, you might think that that means they don't interact electrically. But of course they do um, if they have a dipole moment. And so a lot of the interesting properties of water come from this idea that it's an electric dipole. By the way, we saw an earlier example in the course where uh, we saw this effect and that was, remember when we talked about why does a balloon stick to the wall? Again, it's because effectively the atoms in the wall become electric dipoles and so we get that net attraction. One of the other interesting things about understanding that water is a dipole or water molecules are dipoles is it explains to us how a microwave oven is able to cook food. So a microwave oven uses electromagnetic waves, so electric and magnetic fields, to heat food from within. Um, microwave ovens that we use in our homes or restaurants operate at 2.45 gigahertz so that electric field and magnetic field are oscillating back and forth at that frequency. So think about what happens to a water molecule inside our piece of food. Well, at one instant, the electric field is in this direction within the oven, but then a fraction of a second later, the electric field is in the opposite direction. And so because the electric field is constantly changing directions back and forth in the microwave, it means that every little water molecule is constantly trying to stay aligned with the electric field. And what that means is they're constantly made to rotate back and forth at that frequency. So because of that, what we're doing when we send those microwaves into the food is we are giving kinetic energy to the water molecules. And of course, those water molecules bump into the other molecules in the food that make up the food and pass that kinetic energy on. And that's how the food actually heats up. Because remember, temperature is really just a measure of the average kinetic energy of the molecules in a substance. You'll notice too, this explains why microwaves do better heating certain foods than others. Foods with a high water content heat very well in a microwave. If you put in something like a dry piece of pasta, it's not going to heat up because there's really no water for the microwaves to, uh, to get to rotate. Also, think about what happens when you put something frozen in a microwave. Microwaves have a defrost setting for this purpose because if something is frozen solid, the little water molecules can't oscillate back and forth. They're stuck and therefore we can't very well thaw that food. So the way microwaves do defrost, if you set them to the defrost setting, is they simply cycle the microwaves on and off and then give some time in between for heat to transfer through conduction. So in other words, microwaves come in, get the water molecules on the outside of the food, which are already somewhat free, give them energy. Then we wait for that to conduct in a little bit, and then we put the microwaves on again. And in that way, we can slowly thaw the, the food. If you simply take something completely frozen, put it, in a, put it in a microwave on high, you'll end up burning the outside and the inside will be totally frozen. So let's review some of the important things that we've covered in our four videos, opening videos on electricity. So we know that there are two types of charge, positive and negative. We know the charge is quantized. It comes in a smallest amount and that is the charge on an electron or a proton. So in magnitude, that's the smallest charge that you'll ever measure. We also know that charge is conserved. In any process, the total amount of charge before and after that process has to be equal. We know that one charge exerts another force or exerts a force on another charge. 
directly by Coulomb's law and that's kind of the older way to look at things so charge 1 directly exerts a force on charge 2 remember Newton's third law there's only one Coulomb's law because the force that 1 exerts on 2 and the force that 2 exerts on 1 are equal in magnitude now remember that our more modern way of looking at things is if we want to figure out what's going on between these two charges we say charge 1 creates an electric field and then charge 2 experiences a force in that electric field so here's our definition of the electric field the electric field created by a point charge and the force on a charge in placed in an electric field the next thing we're going to do is we're going to go through a bunch of multiple choice questions and what I'd suggest you do is pause the video and try to answer each one yourself before you listen to my solution here's our first problem what is the magnitude and direction of the electric field due to a negative 23 microcoulomb point charge at a distance of 0 0.20 meters so pause the video think about the answer yourself and then restart the video okay so the correct answer is C and there are a couple things we've got to do here first just to visualize it here's our negative charge that is creating the electric field one of the things that we know about negative charges is they create electric fields that go towards them so that's an important thing to remember so right away since we know that it's a negative charge we know that we have to pick either this answer or this answer neither of these can be right then it's just a matter of plugging in the values we've got 9 times 10 to the ninth times the absolute value of the charge so 23 times 10 to the negative sixth coulombs divided by how far away we are 0 0.20 squared you'll notice that you didn't even really have to use a calculator here because if you just look roughly at what the correct power of 10 is going to be you can see it's going to be 6 and not 12 a proton and an electron are placed in a constant electric field which undergoes the greater acceleration and obviously we know they're going to go in opposite directions but we just care about the magnitude so go ahead and pause the video and come up with the correct answer so the answer here is the electron so let's look at what's the same and what's different for our electron and proton in this constant electric field let's say that our constant electric field is going in this direction well if we put a proton in that field we know it's going to experience a force in the same direction as the field and if we put an electron in the field we know it's going to experience a force that's opposite the direction of the field notice since F is equal to QE so the magnitude of the force that either one of these charges will experience is the same because the magnitude of the charge on a proton and the magnitude of a charge on charge on the electron are the same so the forces in magnitude are the same but now what we have to pay attention to is the mass of an electron and the mass of a proton are very different we know that acceleration is equal to the net force divided by the mass and so even though the proton and the electron will experience the same magnitude of the force the accelerations will be very different because a proton is about 2,000 times more massive than an electron so the electron with the smaller mass will undergo the greater acceleration let's look at this question the diagram shows two unequal charges little q and big q of opposite sign charge q is the greater magnitude than charge little q point x is midway between the charges in what section of the line will there be a point where the resultant electric field is zero so pause the video and really try to think this one through okay the correct answer is B let's see why that is so 
remember what we're trying to figure out here is we're trying to figure out what is the resultant or net electric field anywhere along this line. And so let's start with some point here in the middle. I'm going to call this charge charge 1 and this charge charge 2. We know that positive charges create electric fields that go away from them. So you'll notice that the electric field created by charge 1 would be to the right along that in that region of the line. We know that negative charges create electric fields that go towards them. So notice that the electric field created by charge 2 at that point is also to the right. Well obviously that's going to be true anywhere in between the two charges. And obviously two vectors that are pointing in the same direction can't possibly cancel out. So the answer definitely can't be Wx or Xy. Now let's look at a point out here. Well the electric field being created by charge 1 is still to the right because it's away from the positive charge. The electric field being created by charge 2 would be to the left. So at least from the direction of the two vectors it would be possible that they could cancel out. The problem is that we are closer to the bigger charge. So E2 is always going to be greater in magnitude than E1 and therefore we still can't get cancellation there. But now let's look over here. Here the electric field created by charge 1 will be to the left. The electric field created by charge 2 will be to the right. But now you'll notice we are closer to the smaller charge and farther away from the bigger charge. So again, since the electric field of a point charge is kq over r squared, we can see that the only way we can get the magnitude of E1 to be the same as the magnitude of E2 is if we're farther away from the bigger charge. And therefore, there will be a point between V and W where the electric field is equal to zero. Notice, by the way, if both of these charges had been positive, then the answer would have had to be somewhere between the two charges. Take a look at this problem. An electron is initially moving to the right when it enters a uniform electric field directed upwards. Which trajectory shown below will the electron follow? So go ahead and pause the video and think that through. Okay, so the answer here is Z. And what we have to think about here is, first of all, a charge moving in an electric field um, in a two-dimensional problem like this is just like shooting a cannonball off a cliff, right? So in first semester physics, we did problems like this. I shoot a cannonball. The gravitational field is this way. The ball goes down like that. So these two look like the likely best answers. This is not a physical answer. In other words, no particle is going to make an abrupt left turn. So we know it's not going to be x. It's also not going to be w because that would look like there's no effect um, of the electric field on the charge. Now, how do we pick between y and z? Well, what we have to remember here is that the force on a charge in an electric field is opposite the direction of the field when the charge is negative. Right? If we put a negative q, then f is in an opposite direction from e. And therefore, this is going to be the correct answer for a negative particle like an electron. Notice that answer y would be correct for a positive charge. So if we replace that electron with a proton, did the same thing, then C would be the correct answer. And W, of course, would be correct if we sent a neutron, for example, or any neutral object would not be affected. Two equal and opposite charges a certain distance apart are called an electric dipole. So here's our electric dipole down here. A positive test charge plus Q is placed as shown, equidistant from the two charges. Which diagram below gives the direction of the net force on the test charge? So go ahead, pause the video, and come up with your answer. 
The correct answer here is C, and let's make sure that we understand how to figure that out. First of all, the force that this charge exerts on our positive charge up here is going to be in that direction. And that's simply because they're like charges and they repel. The force that this charge exerts on our positive charge will be in that direction. So those are the two forces, and now we just want to use the superposition principle. In other words, we want to just add those two forces. We can do that with a picture. This vector plus this vector will give me this vector. And so the correct answer is C. How about this question? A dipole is placed in a uniform electric field as shown below. Which statement is true? So the correct answer here is it will experience a net torque. Again, because the field is uniform, and that's really the key word in this question. So that we know, since F is equal to QE, in other words, the magnitude of the force is the absolute value of Q times Z, we know that whatever force the positive side of the dipole experiences, the negative side of the dipole will experience a force in the opposite direction with the same magnitude. So the net force is going to be zero. However, both of those forces are trying to make this object rotate. In other words, they are exerting a torque about the center of the dipole. And so therefore, the dipole will experience a torque. By the way, we looked at an example of what happens to a dipole in a non-uniform field. That's the bending water example. In that case, the field wasn't uniform. And if the field's not uniform, we get both a net torque and a net force. And that's why the water bends in that example. Let's look at this question. In any reaction involving charged particles, the total charge before and after the reaction is always the same. This relationship is known as Well, hopefully you got that one right. That's simply what we mean by conservation of charge. That even though we can create and destroy charges, as we talked about in pair production, um, if we create a positive charge, we also have to create a negative charge so that the total charge before and after any event stays the same. That's what we mean by conservation of charge. An insulator is a material that Go ahead and think about this one and then restart the video. Okay, well, A is definitely wrong. An insulator can experience an electrical force because if I take you know, a piece of plastic and charge it up and charge up another piece of plastic, they'll definitely repel each other. So no problem for an insulator to experience an electrical force. Um, Insulators can definitely be penetrated by electric fields. Uh, a good example of that is glass. Light is an electromagnetic wave. So electric and magnetic fields pass right through, uh, can pass right through something like glass, which is an insulator. Uh, C is also wrong, cannot hold an electric charge. We know that you can put a charge on an insulator. Remember, the key thing to remember about an insulator is that charges can't move throughout the insulator. So if I take a plastic rod and I charge up one end of the rod, an in, on an insulator that charge can't move from there. In other words, it can't move along the rod because charges don't move through insulators. So an insulator can have a charge on it, it can experience an electrical force, electric fields can penetrate insulators, the thing that makes an insulator different than a conductor is the charges can't move in, on, or through the insulator. Two uniformly charged spheres are firmly fastened to and electrically insulated from frictionless pucks on an air table. So in other words, these objects can move freely with no friction. The charge on sphere 2 is 3 times the charge on sphere 1. 
which force diagram correctly shows the magnitude and the direction of the elastic uh, electrostatic forces. Okay, so pause the video and think carefully about this one. Hopefully you got this one right. Um, clearly, both objects are positively charged, so it can't be that one, it can't be that one. We know they're going to repel, so hopefully you were able to eliminate choice A and choice D right away. Now, the only thing that differs among B and C and E are the size of the arrows, so they all correctly show repulsion. Hopefully, you picked E because these forces have to be equal and opposite. Now, there are two ways we know that. First of all, there's only one Coulomb's law. If you thought the answer was either B or C, you'd need two different laws to calculate those two forces. Remember, when we write Coulomb's law, that is the force that one exerts on two or the force that two exerts on one. That magnitude is the same for both. Now, of course, we also know that because it has to be true from Newton's third law. So don't make that mistake of forgetting about Newton's third law. The forces have to be equal and opposite. So the force that one exerts on two and the force two exerts on one are equal in magnitude, and that's what Coulomb's law allows us to calculate. What's the direction of the electric field at point P due to the three positive charges? Okay, well this is a problem using the superposition principle for electric fields. Let's figure out the direction of the electric field created by each of these charges. I'm going to call this charge 1, call this one charge 2, and this one charge 3. You'll notice that all three of these charges are positive, so they are all creating electric fields that go away from them. So in other words, at point P, charge 1 would create an electric field in this direction. Charge 3 would create an electric field in this direction. And charge 2 would create an electric field in this direction. I'll draw it smaller because that charge is farther away from the point. We can now do the vector addition. In other words, we've got E1 plus E2 plus E3. So there's E1, E2, and E3, and we know that the resultant vector goes from the tail of the first vector to the head of the last vector, and we can see that our resultant electric field is this one. What's the direction of the electric field shown between two plates charged as shown? So again, when I draw lines like this, what I'm really representing is plates that are parallel to each other, okay? And I'm just not trying to draw that sort of quasi three-dimensional look, but that's what we're thinking about. Think about holding two pieces of paper parallel to each other. That's what these diagrams represent. Okay, so what's the direction of the electric field between the two plates? Well, the answer is to the right. Because if you think about it, if I put a little positive test charge there, it would definitely be repelled by the positive plate and attracted to the negative plate. And so again, remember that parallel plates is how we create uniform electric fields when we want those. Let's take a look at one last question. Um, what's the direction of the force on an electron placed between these two charge plates? Well, hopefully you got the fact that the answer is up. There are a couple ways you could do that. First of all, we know that a negative charge is going to be attracted to positive and repelled from negative. So you could just look at it that way and realize the force has to be up. The other thing you could do is realize that the electric field in this region of space created by the two plates is going to be down, but we know that the force on a negative charge is opposite the direction of the electric field, 
and therefore the force would be up.